I were to ask you today, what's the leading cause of death in America? What would you say that it would be? Some would say heart disease. Some would say cancer. Maybe accidents. Sugar diabetes. Death row. But the number one cause of death in America today is abortion. More than heart disease and cancer combined here in America on an annual basis. Um, the most dangerous place then in America to live is in a mother's womb. 40% of unplanned pregnancies wind up in the abortion clinics. Almost half of all unplanned pregnancies in America. Now, my message today is not intended to condemn. My message today is not intended to be judgmental in any shape, form, or fashion. But more than anything, my desire is to reveal the loving, big, gracious heart of God. The first time that I ever preached on abortion, there was a father and a mother and a daughter sitting on the back row of this church. And I preached the message God had laid on my heart. And they were probably the most attentive family in the whole building for the next day they had already made an appointment at the abortion clinic for their daughter. Today, that little girl that was born is now about 22 years old. <laughs> to God be the glory. On January the 22nd, 1973, the Supreme Court uh, made a judicial decision based on what they considered to be the understanding of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was written uh, to set slavery free. And they interpreted the word freedom to also mean privacy. And stretching it out, they used terms like viability and maternal health. And even to the point that they broadened it to understand that it meant the emotional well-being of the woman. Since that day, that fateful day in January of 1973, 61 million unborn children were aborted. Approximately 40 times more than all of the soldiers that have died in all of the wars that America has ever fought. While I am preaching this sermon this morning, 150 unborn children will die at the hands of an abortionist. 1.4 children every second in America and 98% of them will be performed for other reasons rather than medical. The abortion movement was fueled by a lot of slogans. One particular one was every child a wanted child and they took that and said that uh, every pregnancy uh, is not a wanted child and an unwanted pregnancy means an unwanted child. I, I've got news. It's not true. There are thousands upon thousands today that are standing in line begging for the opportunity to adopt a little child. <laughs> Nearly... <laughs> Nearly half of the people in this room almost half of the people in this room were born to a set of parents who weren't expecting to get pregnant and weren't prepared for it. Slogans like, if it's not your body, it is not your decision. But the facts are, when a woman is pregnant, there are two heartbeats. There are two brainwave patterns. There are two blood types. There are two genes. There are two DNAs and there are two lives. Slogans like, no one should impose religious morality on others. Uh, 
but isn't it a fact that doctors have been imposing morality on others ever since they took the Hippocratic Oath and stood with their hand raised and swore that they would never put a device into a woman's hands that would ever incur an abortion. Even Planned Parenthood in her early days admitted that life began at conception and that abortion was very dangerous to a person's health and their life and even made the statement, be very careful because it could make you sterile. We legislate morality in terms of drugs, thefts, rape. Another slogan is legal abortions are safe abortions. Really. Let me give you the complications that surround an abortion that could very possibly and do happen. The laceration of the cervix, the perforation of the uterus, hemorrhaging, retention of blood clots in the uterus, allergic reaction to the anesthesia, infertility, cardiac arrest, kidney failure, 50% increase in the possibility of miscarriage going forward, not to mention the psychological issues of depression and nightmares and the intensity of 500% more likely to commit suicide, withdrawal, psychosis, mental breakdowns, frigidity, and promiscuity. Safe to whom? Certainly not the baby. Slogans like, a fetus is not a person, but the facts tell otherwise. In 17 days, that baby has developed its own blood cells. In 18 days, the pulsation of the muscle and heart 19 days, the eyes start to develop. In 20 days, the entire nervous system is in place. At 24 days, the heart is beating. In 28 days, 40 pairs of muscles are developing. At 30 days, there's a regular blood flow. In 42 days, the skeleton is complete. In 43 days, there's brainwave activity. If we were to leave the church today, get in our cars and drive down Indian Trail Fairview or Indian Trail Waxhaw or even on Highway 74 and we were to come across a bloody mass, we would stop our car, get out of our car and we would go look for one of four different signs. The first thing we would do is that we would feel for a heartbeat and then we would try to find out if there was any breath there. We would look for any kind of movement and if we had the possibility, we would check the brain waves. And if we could find one of those four activities in that bloody mass lying on the side of the road, we would do everything humanly possible to bring and to sustain and to keep life in that body. And yet the child in a mother's womb has all four of those present in their little body and yet people pay good money not to save and salvage that life but to end that life. The Bible says that the unborn are people. Yet we find it easier, I think, to kill the non-person. In 1857, what is called the Dred Scott decision by the Supreme Court of the United States, they declared that black people were non-persons. In Germany, under Hitler's regime, the Jew was declared a non-people. Here in America, we have declared the unborn to be non-people. But the word of God says otherwise. In Jeremiah chapter one and verse four, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. In Ephesians chapter one and verse four, the Bible says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. If we think about Jeremiah's mother and Samson's mother, if they had aborted their children before they were born, they would have aborted someone that was in the mind and the heart and the will of God before the foundation of the world. In Job chapter 31 and verse 15, 
Job says, did not he who made me in the womb, he made me, God made me, I'm a person, I'm a viable human being, he made me in the womb. In Psalm 139, 13, the Bible says, for you formed my inward parts. You weaved me in my mother's womb. May I say that a fetus is a person that God is making in the womb. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 17, he said that if I died before I was born, then my mother's womb would have been my grave. My grave. The Bible says that while John the Baptist was still in the womb of his mother, that God filled him with the Holy Ghost. The unborn are people. But not only are the unborn people, they are God's people. They're God's people. The the Bible says in Psalm 127 verse 3, Children are a gift from the Lord. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 20, it was a discussion going on about the fact that Israel had offered up their children to the god Moloch and put put them in the arms of that red hot statue and offered them up as a sacrifice there. And God is responding and he said, you slaughtered my children. The unborn are people. They are God's people. Let me ask you a question, a second question this morning. Which is more valuable? The baby in a mother's womb or the egg of an eagle? If you said the baby in a mother's womb, you'd be wrong. And I checked my facts before I got here this morning. I looked on the website of the National Wildlife Commission. And it's a federal offense to destroy the egg of an eagle. And the penalty is two years in prison and a $250,000 fine. What's the penalty for destroying the unborn? Zero. As a matter of fact, you can pay $500 to $2,000 for the procedure to get it done. You understand the unborn are people that are made in the image of God. We are the crown of God's creation. The unborn are people. The unborn are God's people. And then the unborn are God's innocent people. You ever looked at the scripture in Proverbs 6? I love studying the Proverbs every morning and Psalms every morning. And and, and Proverbs 6 is that passage of scripture that says that there are seven things that God hates. And one of the seven things that God hates is the shedding of innocent blood. Is there anything more innocent than the blood of the unborn? in the mother's womb. You say, preacher, does abortion do that? Does abortion shed innocent blood? I hesitated today to bring this and I hesitated today to describe to you the methodology behind abortion, but I think you need to hear it. I I think you need to see and hear the graphics in your mind for a moment that is so depicted here. Listen to what it says. Here's, Here's a procedure called the suction aspiration. This is a frequently used method of abortion. It's done in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. The mother is given a local anesthetic. The cervical muscle, the womb opening, is stretched open. A hollow plastic tube with a knife-like edge on the tip is inserted into the womb. The suction machine by the way, which is about 30 times more powerful than the vacuum cleaner you use at home, is then turned on and begins to suck out the contents of the womb. Because the baby's bones have not hardened yet, pieces of the body are sucked into the jar. The placenta, the afterbirth, is then scraped from the walls of the womb and sucked out as well, thus completing the abortion procedure. 
Sometimes this is called menstrual extraction abortion if done in the very early weeks of pregnancy. Then there's the dilation curtage. It's the DNC. It's the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, this is similar to the suction abortion except a looped shaped knife, curette, is used instead of a suction tube. The baby and the placenta are cut into pieces and scraped out into a basin. Then there's the procedure of the DNE, the dilation and evacuation that's done in the first 18 weeks of pregnancy. Listen to the description. It's similar to the DNC. The dilation and evacuation procedure is used later in the pregnancy after the baby's bones have hardened. A pliers-like instrument with knife-edged teeth is inserted into the womb and a piece of the body is seized, twisted off, and removed. This procedure is repeated, removing hands, feet, arms, etc., until the baby is entirely dismembered. If the head is large, it's crushed to remove. Uh, the placenta is also cut away and removed. The body parts are then reassembled to be sure nothing is left in the womb to cause infection. Abortions are the shedding of innocent blood. You would think that Exodus 20, 13 and the Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not kill would be enough. But for some, it's just simply not enough. Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 25, cursed is he who strikes down the innocent person. In Exodus 22, 27, the Bible says her officials within her Oh, you ought to listen to this. Oh, you ought to hear this. this. This breaks my heart for this country. Her officials within her, the decision makers, the rulers, the politicians are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. All for money, all for profit. What a commentary this is on America yeah, we got all bent out of shape about New York and we got even more bent out of shape about Virginia. But the fact of the matter is that what most people don't understand, we already have seven states in this country plus the Washington, D.C. that make it possible now that even at the point of birth, abortion is allowed. And what breaks my heart more than anything, I guess, is churches are sitting behind passively and whitewashing the issue as if it didn't exist. That same chapter in the book of Ezekiel in verse 20 says, I am looking for a man to stand in the gap that, will, that I will not destroy this people. First Baptist Indian Trail, will you stand in that gap? God says they're destroying the lives of the innocent. My tendency is to want to destroy the nation, but I'm just looking for somebody that would plead the cause, that would stand in the gap, that would stand in defense so that I don't have to destroy that nation, only the wicked slay the innocent. God told Cain, the cry of the innocent blood of your brother is coming up before me in the book of Genesis. And then in the book of Revelation, God says it's the cry of the blood of the innocent martyrs that is coming up before me. Ladies and gentlemen, if that was true about one man, if that was true about a few men in Revelation that the cry of innocent blood is pouring into the ears of God, how much more true is it that 61 million unborn children, the innocency of their blood has reached the ears of God that is crying out. America is polluted by the shedding of innocent blood. Here, here's the thing, here's the thing. The only recipient of all of those sacrifices are demons. 
If you look at Psalm 106, you discover that the shedding of the blood of the innocent is offered up to the demons. And if we're doing that with 61 million unborn children, how happy must the demons be today? Is the reason the murder, the slaughter of the unborn was the reason that God scattered Israel. They were sacrificing their babies to the god Moloch. Today, we watch as our babies, the unborn, are sacrificed on the altar of convenience. Going to have an abortion. I'm too young to be a mother. I don't have a husband. I'm not old enough. I don't want to lose my figure. Leviticus chapter 18. Turn over there with me if you would. Just look at that passage. Um, I don't want you to miss this. God is crying out out of this chapter by saying, don't do what Egypt did. Don't do what Canaan is doing. Don't let your lifestyles become like their lifestyles. And he identifies and draws great description onto what the atmosphere of those countries were that caused him to allow the enemies to come in and to overtake them. Notice with me in verses 6 through 18 is the sin of incest when there is sexual activity among family members. He calls it sin. And then, if you will, in verse number 20, he says it's adultery. You ought not to lie with another man's wife or another uh, woman's husband. You ought not to do that. That's adultery. In verse 21, he's referring to child killing, the unborn. In verse 22, he is referring to homosexuality as an abomination unto God. In verse 23, he refers to the bestiality and he describes this as the condition of the nations that have become defiled. When I was much, much younger, I wanted to go see a movie called The Graduate. Y'all remember the movie? About a young guy who had an affair with an older woman, a mother of a friend of his. I I wanted to go see that movie, but I couldn't go see the movie. You know why? Because it was R-rated. I later saw it on television. Do you know what it's rated now, today? It was edited on television. You you know what it's rated today? It's PG. So, So don't tell me my country isn't slipping. It has occurred drastically in my own lifetime. Lamentations chapter 4, the nation of Israel and the people that are surrounding it never thought, never thought for a moment that any other nation could come to Jerusalem and overthrow the town and the city and carry Israel away. Oh, but they did. When we think about that, you know what we think about? We're in America. We live in an impregnable country. We live in a country that is the most powerful, I heard it this week, the most powerful nation on earth and we think that we are beyond being overtaken. But ladies and gentlemen, listen, you can't shed the blood of 61 million babies and think for a minute that God is going to continue to spare us. What would you do if a woman came up to you and said, "Uh, I need some advice from you. I have tuberculosis. My husband has syphilis. We've already had uh, three children and I am pregnant with the fourth. Uh, My first child was born blind. My second child died. My third child was born deaf and mute and now I'm pregnant again. What do you think that I ought to do? If you advised that mother to go get an abortion, you would have just killed Ludwig von Beethoven. The 
The unborn are people. The unborn are God's people. The unborn are God's innocent people. And the unborn are defenseless people. Psalm 72 verse 12. He will deliver the needy who cry out. The afflicted who have no one to help. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. Nobody to help them. God says, I'll deliver them. But now listen how he's going to do that. Understand that righteous people are to plead the cause of those that are helpless and defenseless. I posted this on my social media about a month ago in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11. Rescue those who are being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Ladies and gentlemen, we know what we ought to do. We know that 61 million people have already been aborted from their mother's womb. We know that they are people, God's people, God's innocent people, God's defenseless people. And now we are without excuse. And God says that we are to come to their rescue. We're to deliver them. You say, Pastor, why are you spending a Sunday talking about abortion? We, we just came out of the best five weeks in the history of our church. We, we, we need to get back to that 8 to 15 card where we've seen so much success already. Why are you talking about such of this that on a Sunday morning, I want to tell you because of the convicting power of the word of God on my life that has been such a great blessing to me in these days. Out of Proverbs, excuse me, out of Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 16, listen to this. He defended the cause of the poor and needy and so all went well is that not what it means to know me declares the Lord you understand that we, we say that we know the Lord we say that we have an intimate relationship with Christ we say that we're saved we say that we're born again we say that we're going to heaven we say that we know Jesus but one of the fruits of that knowledge and the proof that's in the pudding is the fact that we would stop and stand for those who are defenseless. You know who's pleading the cause of the unborn? Do you know who's pleading the cause of the unborn? It's not the homosexuals. It's not the environmentalists. They're too busy saving the whales and the spotted owls and trying to regulate climate change. It's not the atheists. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called bigots, but we're at the front door defending them. And I believe that the Lord Jesus would probably have us go around to the back door and do the same thing. The unborn are people. They are God's people. They are God's innocent people. They are defenseless people. You rarely ever hear me quoting poetry, but I found one that I want to share. Don't let it oppress you too bad at the beginning. I want you to get ready for a good ending. In a faraway place in a different time, I killed my first child, a most heinous crime. The state didn't come and I didn't stand trial. Judge Blackman was calm when he said with a smile, killing is legal, say we the high court, but don't call it murder, just call it abort. The judge in my heart would not let this case rest. I had no defense when once put to the test. Found guilty I was by my heart's supreme court. You murdered your baby, they screamed in retort. With tears on my cheeks, it was too late. I knew to bring back the life of the child I once slew. 
The gavel slammed down and it rang in my head. You're guilty as charged and deserve to be dead. We now give you torment to pay for your sin was a sentence passed down from my own court within. You will never escape. You're branded, don't hide. You're just due as death. You should try suicide. I was beaten in prison by daily attack. I was paying a debt so I never fought back. No hope of escaping and this I knew well. I cried out to God for my own self-made hell. That day I met Jesus. <laughs> he smiled in my face. He said, I forgive you. Come walk in my grace. Lord, I believe you forgive me and yet blameless you are. Can you pay for my debt? And Lord, please don't touch me, for I am unclean. I'm filthy with murder, a most wretched being. I poured out my story. He showed no surprise. I gazed up with awe at the love in his eyes. He said, I paid for your crime. Yes, was nailed to a tree. There's no condemnation if you'll trust in me. I took on your blame and your curse on my soul so you may be free without judgment and whole. I sputtered, dear Lord, where's the justice in this? I kill my first morning, you offer me bliss? Tears blurred my vision, yet there in his face were eyes of compassion, blue oceans of grace. I thought to myself, now the past has been buried. I'm free of the guilt that for years I have carried. He said to accept, it's a gift that's free. This is atonement, not justice for me. My judge was dismissed, my accusers and jury. The truth of his love made them leave in a flurry. He smiled, walk with me and come learn my way. And grasping his hand, I began a new day. Maybe there are some here this morning that you'd love to turn back the clock. I had a lady come up to me earlier today and she said, oh, preacher, preacher, please don't stop preaching this message. She said, if I had heard this in 1990, I would not have aborted my child. Don't stop preaching. She said, but I found God's forgiveness, his grace and his mercy. Great tears of joy flowed down her face and she said, God has forgiven me and has given me three more children since. You know, God is a God of a new day. And I pray if you've been carrying around the guilt and the shame of a bad decision that you made a long time ago, God's not here to condemn you and neither am I. God's not here to judge you and neither am I. God wants to forgive you. God wants to set you free from the bondage of guilt and shame and give you a new day. Would you stand with me today and let's pray for a minute. Father God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the receptivity of the word that I know that they hold in their heart and their minds. I pray that we would take the challenge to stand in the gap for this nation. That we would stand in the gap and plead to you on behalf of backslidden or lost politicians who refuse to acknowledge the fetus in the womb is a person God's person, God's innocent person, God's defenseless person. And allow those people to be murdered in the womb. God, would you forgive our nation? God, would you heal our land? Before it's too late. God, help us as a church to stand in that gap on behalf of this nation. 
I pray for any that may need to come and just seek you here. Receive your forgiveness and cleansing and mercy and goodness and blessing and newness. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.